a man. Among rocks, with a town in the background. A picture by Giovanni Bellini. A hero seeking inspiration in a glorious landscape. Better than that, the supreme champion of life lived simply and in harmony with nature, Saint Francis of Assisi, in a landscape touched by the fantastic. Two suns light the scene, one in the direction the saint is looking, the other in the background. And the palms of his hands are bleeding. The last recalls a miracle which Bellini's predecessors happily gave the full Hollywood treatment. Celestial beings, bright light from on high, gaping wounds, so why does Bellini tone everything down? 250 years have passed since the death of St. Francis. And this sumptuous picture has been acquired by a succession of Venetian magnates. One of them, a fabulously rich merchant banker. Do they really believe in the poverty preached by the saint? And does Bellini, Renaissance painter and scholar in one, have doubts concerning miracles which subvert the natural order? Or does he really want to paint a dazzling landscape with St. Francis as mere pretext? Is Bellini trying to make the miracle seem natural? The saint's holy retreat in the mountains occupies the foreground, close to a cave where he has made his home. Further back, a rural landscape, separated from the foreground by jagged rocks and this screen of vegetation. And, behind a quietly flowing river, urban civilization, a town, and buildings perched on hilltops, beneath a peaceful sky. Standing firmly erect in his rough, homespun habit, the saint is in the world, and yet outside it too, with his gaze fixed on a strange source of light. Is it the autumn sun? The saint is either open-mouthed in wonder or possibly singing. The bewildered rabbit has started from its burrow. The saint has dropped his stick and sandals. The foliage is lit from the front, although the walls in the distance are in shadow. So we tend to feel that something less mundane is happening. Is the angel, the seraph, appearing to St. Francis? Legend has it that the night turned to day to the nearby shepherd's amazement. Of course, that might explain why the town is so quiet, not a soul in sight. But there's no physical trace of the angel. The light in the foreground might come from a comet. or that in the background from the sun. But the painter goes even further. The heart of the miracle was the stigmata, the five wounds of the crucified Christ, which St. Francis received kneeling down. Here, however, he is standing, and the wounds have been touched in so lightly on the left foot that they have vanished and the wounds are simply marked with blood, although the saint's first biographers tell us that his own flesh took on the shape of the nails. And the wound in the side, which distinguished Christ from the thieves crucified with him, does not appear in the picture. Stigmatization even turns into metaphor. 
the light rays and perspective lines which pass through the saint as he stands with arms outstretched suggest virtual nailing to this crucifix on the edge of the picture. What we actually get is a reminder of the miracle, but not necessarily the miracle itself. The real subject of the picture is thus the saint's relationship with nature. But how can a tranquil landscape steal the limelight from divine intervention? There is no river or town near the real Monte Alverna, the saint's chief retreat. And so this is not an actual landscape, but a figment of Bellini's imagination. The town stands for the saint's former life. The life of an arrogant rich kid from a family of cloth merchants. The life of the new bourgeoisie who, with their talent for trade and finance, are making Italy's cities wealthy and starting to worry about their own salvation. A life which St. Francis puts behind him. He renounces his possessions. The bridge to the town is symbolically cut. Every knot on his coarse habit represents a vow of poverty, chastity, obedience, which he clearly honours. The only trace of a meal, this simple picture. The only sign of a church, this handbell. His only means of study, this book and parchment. A heron as symbol of fidelity to the church or of the old Sybaritic lifestyle. And the donkey to carry him and symbolise bodily service. But the town itself is not demonised. The donkey reminds us that Jesus returned to Jerusalem and the shepherd that the gospel must be preached to the lost sheep. Saint Francis sets them an example to follow, that of gratitude. His eyes turn to the light. He seems like the bird to be singing a hymn to his creator. And his body echoes the curve of the laurel bush. But this isn't the Garden of Eden either, since manual labour responds to nature's bounty, as he turns a cave into a home, a vine into a pergola, a fold in the ground into a garden, and a spring into a conduit. If we cannot imitate Christ's sacrifice on the cross, Bellini suggests a life of giving and of prayer as a mild alternative. Building a chapel, donating a religious painting, these are some of the good works the rich can perform in the hope of gaining paradise. At the time Bellini paints his picture, the Franciscans are setting up special loan agencies the Monte di Pieta, to help the poorest of the poor. The poverty of St. Francis has become a giving-based economic system and is steadily making the Franciscans more powerful. They control hundreds of buildings in town centres and have already given the church two popes. So, is Bellini simply their mouthpiece? The hallowed landscape is not Bellini's invention. Traditionally, it is a stylized background which indicates that the holy person portrayed is in a different world from the viewer. But interest in landscape as such becomes more marked in Italian and French art from the start of the 15th century. This pictorial version of the story of St. Anthony is an example. While most of the episodes take place beneath a gilded sky or in a church, those where the saint is tempted in the desert are set in a real landscape. As in the desert scene with St. Francis, there is a broken sky, blue, yellow and white, and the high viewpoint allows us to explore the setting in depth. 
Contemporary Flemish painters take this mixture of the sacred and profane even further. Van Eyck puts the Virgin face to face with Chancellor Rollin, who has commissioned the picture. The landscape in the background is an idealised image of his territories, which he can then compare to an ideal city, with the Virgin as its queen. In spite of the crenellated wall which separates her from the secular world, she is almost being used to convey a political message. How can landscape be stopped from destroying the necessary distance between sacred and profane? Bellini combines three solutions to the problem. First solution. He uses a tiled pavement and sturdy balustrade to separate the risen Christ from ordinary mortals. Or the Virgin and martyrs from the earthly scene with its hermits and centaurs. Compare this transfiguration scene, where a ravine and a wooden fence separate us from the mountain where the miracle is taking place. Here, variations in the terrain serve this separating function. Variety and precision of detail also make us forget that the whole scene is imagined. We feel that we are really seeing the beauties of nature. A nature so delightful that it seems good, and so good that we feel it was created for us by a benevolent divinity. Second solution, signal the sanctity of the central figure. Instead of using the conventional halo, Bellini invests the saint's posture with mystery. That mystery lies in the contrast between an unusually powerful and clear-cut physical presence which stands out against the pale stone behind it, and the outward signs of spiritual ecstasy. He is directly in front of us, and yet his attention is elsewhere. Third solution, light. Bellini applies very thin layers of paint on top of one another, which creates transparent effects. but also makes certain surfaces, like the stone, seem luminous. The underlying bright colours light them from within. Bellini's Saint Francis thus seems a subtle forerunner of what we now call fantasy in literature and film. In an ordinary natural setting, something in a person's behaviour, a brightness in the air, and unexpected details all suggest the presence of the supernatural.